All right, we're going to be coming back to 2 Corinthians 6. The part of the chapter where, where the main focal point of the sermon is going to come from is there in verse number 17 where the Bible reads, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And we're going to go into that a little bit further in context. Keep a bookmark here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 because we are coming back to it. And it was, it was, it's a very important passage that I had to start off with. But turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 20. And what I'm preaching about tonight is separation and why we need to separate ourselves from this world as Christians. Why our lives should not be just like the lives of everybody else in this world. Just like everyone else out there, whether they're religious, not religious, or anything, or even the religious people. Okay, we need to separate ourselves unto the way that unto the life that God has called us to live, changing, transforming our minds, being renewed day by day and becoming more in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. This is what we are being called to do. And, you know, you say to yourself, well, you fundamental Baptists, you're always, you know, making these rules and have these standards and you know. Your women are always wearing dresses and skirts, and your men are always clean cut and all this. You're like, why do you, why do you do that? Don't you know that that's just old? That you know, that's not the not the way that that things are these days. Why do you have to be so old fashioned? Well, it's not like we're just trying to go out of our way to do something different in order to be different. Right. It's not for the sake of just looking different from anyone else. We're trying to do what's right, and it's funny how many people. I've gotten a hard time from, from family members, from friends that, and I'll be honest with you, I don't shove things down people's throats. We live the way that we live. Me, my wife, my children, you know, we homeschool. My wife wears things that I believe pertain to a woman. I wear things that pertain to a man. We do things our way, but it's not like I go around and just tell everyone, you're wicked, you know, my, you know the women that have short hair and, and, and the men that have long hair and, and, and all these little things that that the Bible talks about, okay? There's scripture for everything that I just said, by the way. These aren't just things that I've just imagined in my own mind that, hey, I'm just going to do this because I feel like it. There's scriptural reasons for this stuff. We're trying our best to, to be pleasing unto the Lord and say, God, we care about every word that you write in this book. If this, if this is important to you, it's important to me. And we're going to try to live our lives accordingly. And when we separate ourselves, we got to understand, see, God's a holy God. And Brother Robert, I was out soloing with Brother Robert today, and he did a really good job of explaining that when he was giving the gospel to this one lady, how oftentimes we forget how holy God, and what holy even means. Holy, sanctified, separated, set apart. God is perfect. God is pure. God is holy. God has, you know, is completely without sin, and his standards are set at perfection. That's what his standards are. His holiness demands it. We have a tendency to think, I'm not that bad. Because we make the mistake of comparing ourselves among ourselves. Of saying, well, if I compare myself to this person, <laughs> I'm doing really good. You know, how am I not going to make it, right? Because look at all the things that they're doing. I don't do those things. It's the wrong standard. Right. Our standard isn't the rest of the world. That's why we need to be separate from this world. Because the world's standards are really low. If you want to feel good about yourself, set the standard real low. Hey, I'm not doing it. At least I didn't kill anybody. I mean, it's seriously, like, this is the main reason when we talk to people out soul winning, why they think they're going to heaven. Well, I haven't murdered anybody. I mean, talk about putting the standard down pretty low. Like, well, that's going to get you into heaven because you haven't killed someone? You haven't taken another life? Are you mad? Like, do you really think that that's how low the bar is to make it into heaven? You are sadly mistaken. A lot of people are, and it's sad. And, and, you know, I think a lot of times people just don't even really think it all the way through. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. God is a perfect God, and God is a judge. And that's another thing that we need to realize, is that when he says, these are the rules, this is right, this is wrong. When you break my rules, there's a punishment to be paid. 
Once he says something, once he says the wages of sin is death, once he says that this is the punishment, he can't go back on his word. Amen. He needs to, to, to retain his integrity. His word means nothing if he just goes back on his word. And it's an excellent illustration that you gave, and I use this illustration sometimes too. You know, uh, Brother Robert, I was told says, you know, hey, what if, what if, um, what if I were to get, get drunk and get pulled over for drunk driving, you know, and, and stand before the judge and, and maybe get in an accident, you know, and, and hurt someone else, right? But the judge says, well, you've done a lot of good things in your life. You, you know, you've been helping people out. You're going to church. You're, you're a productive member of society. Yeah, you screwed up this one time. So we're just going to ignore it like it never happened. Now, great for Robert, right? Hey, you'd be like, yeah, awesome. I got off the hook. But can you look at that judge and say, that's a righteous judge? That's someone who's actually judging a person according to the law? Not at all. They, that's a wicked judge. That's someone who is, who is showing partiality and being a respecter of persons. That's not who God is. God's not a respecter of persons. God says this is, and he's the perfect judge. Amen. So as part of his holiness and purity, he can't just look the other way when people sin. And obviously that's where Jesus Christ came. I mean, someone, someone has to pay for our sins. It has to be done. We can either pay for ourselves as eternity in hell, because that's what we deserve for the, as the punishment for our sins. Or we can accept the substitute that was made for us, the exact same punishment that was made by our Savior, who didn't deserve a punishment, but was able to receive that punishment because he didn't have his own sins. And obviously, you know, I mean, we're all saved here. We understand salvation. But understanding that holiness of God and what he demands of us, there's two ways to be saved and go to heaven. One is be perfect. Anyone in here haven't screwed that up yet? <laughs> I don't know anybody. The other way is through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The, the one who was perfect. The one who did uh, suffer and bleed and die to save us. Those are the only two ways that we're going to make it to heaven. Because God is a holy God. God has spoken and he will not repent. God's not a man that he should repent. And, and the words that he say stand. Now, The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 1, I'll just read this for you. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You have to want, and I, and I preach this when we went through Proverbs, but you have to want to separate yourself. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You're just going to be in your same old routine, doing the same things that the world does and, and just kind of mimicking what everyone else does. And that's human nature. I mean, when, when people are called sheep as humans, it really is true. And, and everybody wants to say that they're not a sheep, but there, is, there are qualities in all of us that are sheep-like. We have a herd mentality in general. Now, some more than others, but basically those who you spend your time around and you're with, you will end up acting in some ways and speaking in some ways like they do. That's right. It is part of human nature. This is who we are. It's a reality. It's a fact. The more time you spend together with people, you become more alike. So it's important who we spend our times, time around. If you want to be more godly, if you want to be more separated, spend your time around other people who are more separated and, and on the same path that you want to be on. You want to be holy? You want to be obeying God and doing His right things? Hey, get yourself in church. Get yourself around His people. Get yourself around people who, who are, you know, honestly trying to do the same exact thing. And it'll happen. The Bible says that having, you know, through desire a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. It's a wise thing to want to separate yourself. Uh, did I have you turn to Leviticus 20? Yes? Leviticus 20. We're going to start reading in verse 22. See, in the past, God separated a nation unto himself. There was a separation. That's where the nation of Israel was formed. He says, you know, you are my people. I have called you out. I, you know, he called out Abraham. He told him to move in a strange land. He called out Moses out of Egypt. He's saying, we're putting you over here. Okay, this I, I've, I've determined. This is where I want you to be. You are going to be a people that represents me. You are going to be this nation that is called out. You're going to be different from all the world. And we see this back in Leviticus chapter 20. 
Look at verse number 22. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. Now Leviticus 20, of course, is a very famous chapter that talks a lot about the death penalty. And there's a lot of things that the world today hates to hear, like verse number 13, if a man therefore lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, um, he's committed an abomination, both of them shall be surely put to death. And I know I didn't quote that exactly right, but um, their blood shall be upon them. But those are things that, that God wrote in his law. And he says, my laws and my statutes are perfect, and you need to keep these and do them that the land whether I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. You're going to be different from the world. And he explains here, look at verse number um, 23, and ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. And for those people who don't understand how God could command the children of Israel to, to, to kill the, the women, the children, the men, like everybody, and just wipe out, the li like wipe out entire cities, Read the law. Read the things in the law where you're like, why did he have to say that? Why did he even have to say that you shouldn't lie down with an animal to have a, a physical sexual relationship with a beast? Why is that even part of the law? Like, like, should we even have to say that? Yeah, he did. You know why? Because the people in the, in the land that he brought them to, they did all of these things, the homosexuality, the bestiality, the child sacrifices, the, the, the incest, all of the things that you're reading in the law and you're like, well, of course. The rape, the mur everything. He says they did all of that stuff. That's why judgment came. It, 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 it wasn't that, well, I just like these people better than these people, so just go kill them all and I'm going to give you their land. That wasn't it at all. God was doing many things simultaneously. He was trying to call out of people. He was trying to get people to, to demonstrate, this is who I'm using. I want the whole world to know who I am, and I'm going to use you to do it. Because Abraham was faithful. Because Moses was faithful. Because Isaac was faithful. These people were faithful to me. So as a blessing to them, as a result, that's who I'm going to use to, to, to let everyone know who I am, what my laws are, who, you know, and everything about me. This is the way that God did things. Whether you like it or not, that's what he did. And he, when he brought them into the land, of course, there was people already inhabiting there, but they were wicked. So God was bringing judgment upon them. God brings judgment upon every nation that gets into this sick, disgusting, perverted sins like Sodom and Gomorrah. He brought his judgment upon them. He rained fire and brimstone down from heaven. There are times where, where a nation gets so corrupt, so wicked, so perverted that God says, okay, the only choice left now is destruction. Nineveh was headed that way. When we read in the book of Jonah, they repented. They turned from their wicked ways and God spared them. He said, yet 40 days and God's going to overthrow Nineveh. Destruction's going to come. That was, that was Jonah's message that he didn't want to preach. But he did end up being a watchman after a little bit of uh, persuasion from the Lord, right? When he didn't want to do it at first, he ended up being the watchman. And what happened? They repented. Good on them, right? But Sodom, not the same. The, the, the um, Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, you know, all these people that were in the land of Canaan before the children of Israel got there, he had them destroyed. He had them wiped out. That was, his, that was his judgment. It was a judgment on the complete perversion because they did all these things. And God's saying, look, you need to keep these commandments. You need to be different from them. You need to be different from the world. This is what's right. Look at verse 24. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. God wants us separate. Verse 25, ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. Now, we don't have the same dietary restrictions that were under the Mosaic law. 
But what he's doing here, he's doing this for a purpose. He's trying to show them, look, there's a difference between clean and unclean. There's a difference between you and the rest of this world. I am calling you out as a special people. You are to be different. You are to be separate from the rest of the world. You need to show, demonstrate that there is a difference with God's people. Verse 26, and ye shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. He's a holy God and his demand for us is that we be holy. He says, you know what? I'm holy, so I want you to be holy. That's his commandment. Now, can we perfectly keep that? No. We know we fall short, but it doesn't mean that we don't, you know, try to do our best to do that. And it doesn't change God's commandment still that we need to be holy. Right. The commandment still stands, right. whether we can complete it or not. Obviously, because he loves us, he still gave us grace and mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ because we failed. But the commandment is still there. And, and it really boggles my mind for people who want to criticize and just... It, it's, it, and I was mentioning earlier, I don't even think I got to finish my point because I started going off on another rabbit trail how people will criticize the way that we live when we're not trying to tell them, you need to do this, you need to do that. We're just doing our own thing, yet the criticism still comes. Why? Because it shines a light on what they're not doing. I, I believe that. I think it's just because it makes them look bad because you're, doing, you know, you're trying to actually follow what the Bible says, and they're not. Because they don't care what the Bible says. They won't tell you that they don't care. But it's evident. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy 26. Fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy 26. Still keep your finger in 2 Corinthians. We're coming back to that. Deuteronomy 26. We're going to see another Old Testament separation of his people. We saw in Leviticus. We're going to see in Deuteronomy 26. Verse 16. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments, thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. Verse 18, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. Peculiar means different. Not like everyone else. You're a little peculiar. You're a little bit different. He says, you have avouched the Lord. You have vowed that you are going to follow the Lord. You're going you're to obey Him. You're going to follow His commandments. You're going to keep His judgments. You're going to do what He says. And this day, well, God's avouched you to be His peculiar people. As He hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all His commandments, and to make thee high above all nations which He hath made, in praise, and in name, and in honor. And that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God as he hath spoken. God wants us to be holy. Now look, I'm not this big advocate of lifestyle evangelism. If you're not familiar with that, it was just, you know, where people come up to you. You wait for them to see how different you are. And then they come up to you to ask you, what do you have? Because I want that. Okay. We went over this morning what God requires of us when it comes to evangelism. However, we ought to still be living a different lifestyle. Now, when we're living a life that's peculiar, most people aren't looking at you going, I want that. When you're living a separated life, and see, that's why we don't use it for evangelism, but there still should be something different about us. You still should recognize well, here's someone that actually believes the Bible. People claim Christ all the time. People claim to believe in the Bible all the time. We were speaking to a lady again, I was telling this afternoon, who complained about the hypocrisy. And how often do you hear that? I mean, you hear that from everybody. The hypocrisy in churches. And look, it exists. But just because people fail, just because human beings are hypocrites, show me one person who's not a hypocrite to some degree. At some level, we're all hypocrites. Nobody, and I mean nobody is 100% true to every single view or principle that they espouse. Everybody falls short. Everybody. 100% of the time. I mean, 100% you know, of the people. Nobody is purely not a hypocrite. I mean, she was a hypocrite. She was talking about how people only they want to pick and choose what they believe. 
And before we left, she said, well, I believe some of the Bible. You're complaining about other people who pick and choose what they believe, and now you're telling me that you're picking and choosing what you believe. It doesn't get more hypocritical than that, yet they're the hypocrites. <clears throat> but we ought to strive not to be hypocrites. I mean, that's the goal. We, we, we ought to strive to be separate unto the Lord and not just say we believe in Christ. Oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. If you believe it, do it. If you believe it, change to, to be more conformed to this book. Do you really believe this? And again, you could, as you read your Bible, ask yourself, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this? Read it. Do I really believe this? Every, every chapter you read, every, every time you go through, and when you see the commandments, and when you see things that God's calling out as sin, when you see things that we're being admonished to do, when you see things about um, you know, true religion, you go out and, and visit the fatherless and the widows, do you believe that? I mean, there's a lot of things in the Bible. Just ask yourself, do you believe that? Why well, are you doing anything? Are you doing any of those things? If you're not being active about it, do you really believe it? At, you know, let's, let's try to be real. Be real with yourself. Be real with your belief. And, and if you're not doing things, look, I know none of us are perfect, so we're all going to find some areas where we're not, we're not fulfilling as we ought to. Have a humble heart to change. Don't have the stiff neck. The stiff neck is going to lead you to destruction. Children of Israel were a great example of that in the wilderness, having a stiff neck. It didn't work out so well for them. They didn't get things any easier when they, when they didn't want to listen to God. <clears throat> God's avouched us. I believe this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. You say, oh, but those were, that was the nation of Israel. That was different. That was, in, in, in one regard, yes, it was, but it still applies to us today, I believe, where God wants a peculiar people. It's no longer the physical nation of Israel. That's who it was. God did choose the physical nation of Israel, and, and the physical nation came from the man Israel, came from Jacob and, and his descendants. And God chose, and of course, of his seed came Christ. He said, not unto seed as of many, but unto one, which is Christ, where the, the promise was um, fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Savior. But he did also reveal himself. The oracles of God were revealed unto the Jews. The, you know, God used prophets who were Jews. Jesus Christ and his disciples. You know, I mean, this is, this is the nation who he was using at the time to make himself known. But when Jesus Christ came to his own and his own rejected him, he took away... Um, what he had given to them, basically, and brought and gave it to a nation, bring, uh, bring forth the fruits thereof. So look at First Peter chapter two, verse number nine. This is how we know that we are his people today, because these commandments were to his people to be separate. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And that epistle that Peter was writing here, if you flip back to chapter number one, you can see who it is that he's writing to. Who is it addressed to? Who is Peter speaking to? Verse number one, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers... You know what strangers are? Foreigners. To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He wasn't writing this to the Hebrews. He wasn't writing this to the physical nation of Israel. He's writing this to the strangers. He's saying, this epistle is for you, to you strangers who are scattered about. For, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 says, But ye... The strangers are a chosen generation. Right. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. There's one of the transitions from the New Testament. He's saying now, he's gonna, and God is going to use any nation that is bringing forth the fruits thereof to be his people. <laughs> You can't get, you can never get comfortable in the fact that, well, we're God's people because he doesn't care about your genealogy. As well, the Bible says avoid genealogies. He doesn't care who you're physical descended from. He cares who's doing the work. Right. 
Who's living for me? Who's going to shine the glorious gospel? That's who I'm going to use. And he says, you know what? The branches were broken off because of unbelief. They could be grafted back in again, right? Anyway, I mean, the physical Jews, they, they, they were broken off. Hey, they could be grafted right back in again too. They just need to put their faith in Christ. Amen. Start doing the work. There's no reason why they can't be doing the exact same thing again, just like anybody else. I mean, you look at the Arab population. You can look, go to Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Hey, if they just, just all repented and started doing the works of, of God, you know what? They'd be grafted into that tree also. Amen. There's no difference. I mean, they're, they're just like anybody. And that's what God's doing, and that's who he wants to use. But he's calling out a peculiar people. He's saying, who's going to be a different? Who's going to be separate from the world? Who's going to be a peculiar people? <clears throat> Turn, if you would, back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hopefully you kept the bookmarker there. We ought to be a peculiar people separate from the world. Why separate ourselves so we could seek in our mouth with all wisdom? What are we separating ourselves from? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 14. We're going to see here being yoked with unbelievers. This is one area we need to make sure. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, who you spend your time around is who you're going to be like. You're going to, they're going to rub off on you and you're going to end up acting and doing things similar to what they do because you're spending your time with them. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And what's a yoke? It's, a yoke is for an animal, it's for an ox, you know, for oxen to work together, right? You're striving together. You're, you're joined at the necks and the yoke. You're, you're both doing the same thing and you're both going to be headed the same way. So when you yoke up with someone, he says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Don't get yourself in that position to where you're, by, you're bound together. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, how do you get unequally yoked with someone? And I've heard this applied many times this way, and I think it's a very good application, is one way is getting married. Getting married to an unbeliever. That's a yoke. You are making a commitment, and you are saying, you know, until death do us part, you're saying, we're going to stay together. You are yoking up together with, with someone else. If you're not married and you're going to get married, and you're a believer, don't yoke yourself up with an unbeliever. Don't do it. It's going to cause you problems. I mean, the Bible is clearly telling us right here, don't be unequally yoked. Marriage is a great example, but I don't think it's the only one that you can apply to this. I think any situation where you could see yourself just getting tied up and bound with somebody is not a good idea. I mean, there's certain work situations where you're just going to be bound up with that one person. You know, everyone needs a job. Everyone needs to work. You can't expect your boss to always just be, you know, find some saved Christian to work for. But going to just some nine to five, you punch in, you do your work, you go out, is different than being yoked up with somebody and just really, you know, bound together. Here, when you're working for someone, you, you could leave. You, you, know, you don't have to. We, li we live in a, in a, in a right-to-work state, right? You could, you could come together and, and, and decide to work, or you could part your separate ways, no big deal. You know, you're not bound in, in like bondage together where, where you can't leave. This is the type of situation you need to watch out for. Don't get yourself bound up with unbelievers. You need to be separate from that. We need to be separate from... Because look, there is no fellowship. And this shouldn't be your best buddy either. Your best friend should not be some unbeliever. I mean, how much do you really have in common with an unbeliever? Or how much should you have in common? How much you have in common might, might say a little bit about where you're at spiritually. If you have everything in common with some unsaved person, you don't have the right priorities. Because their priorities, I guarantee, are not going to be serving the God of the Bible. They're not saved. They don't even believe in Him. <clears throat> Bible says, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We need to be surrounding ourselves and being yoked up, if anything, with people who want to serve and seek God first. 
Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What are we separating ourselves from? We're separating ourselves from being yoked up with unbelievers, but not just being yoked up with unbelievers. What about the believers? Believers who live wicked lives. We need to be separate. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse number 6. The Bible reads, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. He's explaining here, you know, the way that leaven works, a little bit of yeast, put a little bit of leaven in bread, pretty soon the whole thing becomes leaven. It spreads, right? It grows. And he's likening that to sin. When you get sin in your life, and you, you, you introduce maybe a, a wicked or a sinful person, it's going to grow, it's going to spread on others. But let, let's see exactly where he takes this. We're going to keep reading here. Verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. What he's doing here now, he's clarifying to the Corinthians, I told you before that you shouldn't be hanging out and spending time with fornicators. Right? And he's, he's going to clarify what he meant by that. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or the covetous, extortioners, idolaters. He says, if you just applied that to every single person, he says, then you just need to get out of the world completely. Because the, when, you, when you deal with people just in general on a day-to-day -day basis, just out in the world, people who are not, you know, born-again believers trying to live righteously, you're going to run into covetous, you're going to run into fornicators, you're going to run into all these people because they don't have the knowledge of God. I mean, that's what you get out in the world. And he's saying, if you're going to avoid that altogether, then you just have to get out of the world, right? You just have to go and... and and go into the wilderness somewhere and make your little home and don't have any contact with anybody. But that's not what he wants us to do. He's saying that that's not what you should be doing. But what he explains here, look at verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Now, unfortunately, there's too many churches that are not taking heed to the example that with the scripture that we have written here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 on who is allowed and who is not allowed in church. And as I mentioned to you all this morning, sometimes doing the right thing can be uncomfortable, right? It's not easy to always do, to tell somebody you're not welcome. Hey, do you want to go grab a bite to eat? No. Now, is this talking about... The, the person who just got saved yesterday and comes to church and they're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend and they're a fornicator? No. It says here, if any man is called a brother, right? Anyone who's been going to church for a little while knows that like, you know, people who have shown themselves faithful, they're coming to church, you know, they're getting right with God and pretty soon, brother so-and-so, right? They've proven themselves that, they're, you know, they're, they're, they've been saved for a while. They've grown. They know better. You can't hold people to say, you know, someone shows up for the first time after they get saved. They don't know any better usually. They need to be taught this stuff. They need to start getting right. But at some point, you're going to say, you're a brother and you're doing this wickedness. And there's certain specific sins that it calls out. It's not every single sin. We're all sinners. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to talk to anybody. Let's pay attention to this list, too, and realize how bad they really are. Because the world's going to tell you that fornication isn't a big deal. Everybody does that, right? Oh, the kids, they, they go out, they sow their wild oats, yeah, and then maybe later on you settle down and get married. Hey, look, kid, if you're known as a brother or a sister in this church, if you're someone who's known and you end up being a fornicator, you're not welcome here. Not until you repent. You repent, you get right with God, we'll take you back, won't even bring it up to you. We'll show you the forgiveness that, that Christ has, where we can forgive and forget. And that's what we want, is to get right. But there comes a point to where someone that's called a brother, we find out you're a fornicator. Or look at this, covetous. There's a lot of Christians that don't even realize it's a sin. Being 
Co what does it mean to be covetous? You want things that don't belong to you? You want things that you can't have? In the Ten Commandments, it talks about coveting a neighbor's wife. Right? You, you can't be going after someone else's wife. You're covetous. And people who are like that, people who are covetous, you're not even supposed to have a meal with them. If you're not supposed to have a meal with them, they're definitely not supposed to be fellowshipping with you in church and everything else. Hey, look, there is a standard. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. When you start allowing just whatever, everything goes, hey, everybody welcome, come on in, is the, is the common popular catchphrase for churches these days. Not here, not a Word of Truth Baptist church. We're not saying everybody's welcome, come on in. We actually hold a standard here, and it's a biblical standard. We'll go out and preach the gospel. We'll get you saved at your house. But once you get saved, come on in, we'll teach you. And you become a brother. You become someone who's, who's known and becomes faithful. And you get into these sins. You become an idolater, a railer, a drunk. There are people you need to just say, I'm not, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And you know what it is? It's for their own good. The Bible says to deliver such an one unto Satan that the soul may be saved. You know, there, there's people, and at the church at Corinth specifically, had a, I mean, they had all kinds of problems going on in their church. You read 1 and 2 Corinthians, I mean, Paul's just, just laying down the hammer on a lot of things. Not an ideal, perfect church by any means, but we get a lot of great doctrine out of it. At least we could see this and say, okay, yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. This is how we ought to handle these things. This is how we ought to deal with it. They had the man who had had his... Uh, father's wife and you know it's not clear we assume is a, a, a you know a divorce had taken place there or something but he's showing up to church with his father's wife fornication such as not to even mention among the gentiles like this this the gentiles don't even you know the, the unsaved heathen don't even do this you're bringing this to church We need to be sanctified. We're supposed to be, you know, his, God's people are supposed to be set apart. There are certain things that we say, no. This is a standard and you, are, you should know better because you're a brother. You know this. And again, you know, people say, oh, but Jesus went, he ate with sinners and publicans and harlots stuff. Yeah, he did because he was trying to give them the gospel. And we'll do the same exact thing. We'll love them. We're not going to shun people that don't know any better, that need to get saved. But when you become a brother, when you become a member of this church and you become faithful and you become known for the love and then you turn back to this vomit, you turn back to this, to this wickedness and this covetous, extortioning, drunken lifestyle, we're going to say, get out until you get right and then come back. Why? Because we don't want your leaven to spread the whole lump and infect the whole church. Because what happens? You get someone who's known in the church, hey, brother so-and-so, yeah. He's getting drunk on the weekends. What happens with that? Someone knows and it becomes tolerated and it's just like, okay, well, I guess I could do it too. Why not, right? No one's saying anything. No one's doing anything about it. It must be okay. And that is the message that you're sending when everything's tolerated. Well, it must just be okay. I mean, if you're tolerating it, I mean, do you have anything where you say, I won't tolerate this? I know there's a lot of things in my house that I won't tolerate. Not going to happen in my house. And you know, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to tolerate in this church either. And it's not because I just have some pet peeve on some issue. It's because we're reading the scripture here. Right. We're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading the commandments of the Lord through the Apostle Paul. Verse number 12 says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. I love that. So what are you doing? You're judging people? <laughs> yeah. Don't you judge them that are within? Hey, look, we don't need to worry about the unsaved world. God's going to judge them. I mean, we could try to give them the gospel. We don't need to be judging them and not eating with them and everything else and holding that same standard with them. God's going to judge them. But you know what? Within the church, within the believers, within you know, with your brothers and sisters... We do judge. Now, it needs to be a righteous judgment. 
Again, no respecter of persons. And, and too often, again, the, the, oftentimes the, the person who's been in church forever that has all this clout and that puts all kinds of money in the plate gets, gets into one of these wicked sins. Preacher's afraid to say anything to him because he doesn't want him to leave. Everyone else starts to see what's going on. And before you know it, you got a sin problem in your church. That leaven starts leavening the whole lump. Verse 13, But them that are without God judge it. Therefore, put away from among yourselves, look at this, that wicked person. The person who's committing fornication, the brother that's committing fornication, the brother that's covetous, the brother that's an idolater, the brother that's a railer, the brother that's a drunkard, the brother that's an extortioner is wicked. That's what the Bible says. They're a wicked person. Put them away from among you. It's a tough love that they need to face. Everybody needs to understand there's consequences for our actions. Look, we show grace and we're you know, generally forgiving over a lot of sins, a lot of infractions, a lot of imperfections that we have. These are some major sins. There's a line drawn and the line is drawn here very clearly spelled out for us. And you know what? There's, you know, people want to ask us, well, should this person be kicked out of church for this? Is it, is it what the Bible says? If not, then no. I mean, I'm not going to start making up my own rules. Well, this person, you know, whatever. I, don't even, I can't even think of anything right now. Just some other sin, right? They're involved in some other sin. Don't tell me about every sin that everybody's involved in. Okay, but if there is something going on like this and someone who's known as a brother, I do need to know about this. And look, I, I don't want gossip. I don't want backbiting. Like I said, I don't want to know everybody's sin life and what's going on in everyone's life. You know, I have a great view of everybody in this church. I love you. And as far as I'm concerned, you guys are all doing great and you're perfect and, and no one's got any problems here. Okay? And I'm honest. Like I, that, that's the way I view everybody in this church. I, I don't know what goes on in your personal life. I don't want to know. The only time I'm going to want to know is if, yeah, brother so-and-so, he's a drunk. I need to know that. That's a big deal. That's something that needs to be dealt with then. You know what? We're not going to fellowship with you. We need to be separate. There needs to be a different... Look, all those things, you expect all that from the world. That's what the world pumps in the media. That's what they, they, they push in the television and on the movies and everything else that they do and in the music. Everything that comes from the world, it's all about this stuff. You get bombarded with it all the time when you go out into the world. But that's not the way it's supposed to be among God's people and in his house. 1 John chapter 2, you have to turn, or turn if you would to... Um, well, actually, you know what? Go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 2. There's a few things we're going to see there. I'll just start reading for you. 1 John chapter 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We need to be separated from this world, and the way that you separate is by not loving it. The things that this world puts out, you shouldn't be loving that and that's all you're about. No, man, I can't wait to get home and watch this and do, you know, go see this filthy movie with this sodomite lead actor and, you know, that's where you're getting your entertainment from. We're not supposed to love those things. That's not where our desires should be at all. I mean, look, if, if you're struggling with that, you need to, you need to get your priorities right and, and recognize and start to hate the sin. Because if you're loving these things, you know, we need to have a, a proper love-hate relationship. We need to love the things that are righteous, love the things of God, and hate the things of wickedness, and hate the, the evil. And we can't just be all-embracing of everything, because that doesn't even make any sense. But look at uh, verse number 1, 1 John chapter 2. We need to separate ourselves from sin. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He said, and look, the, the, the Apostle John is writing this epistle saying, look, I'm writing all this stuff to you so that you don't sin. He says, well, if you do sin, obviously we have an advocate with the Father. We have Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. We know that He's there to help you out as, um, as our Savior. But, but the point is to not sin. Verse number two, and He is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know Him 
if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. I brought this up last week, but even you know, the people that want to say, oh, well, Christ came and, and the, law, the law is null and void. The law doesn't exist anymore. We're free in Christ. We, we've got this grace. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And all these things they want to say to make it acceptable and tolerated that they don't want to follow the commandments anymore. Well, if you're claiming that you know God, that the Bible says right here, he that saith, I know him, and you're not keeping his commandments, you're a liar. You don't know God. If you're not doing the things that he said, you don't know him. The Bible says the truth is not in you. The people want to make justifications for their sins. Oh, well, we're free. Yeah, we're free from the curse of the law. We don't have to pay the penalty of hell. Thank God, which is what we deserve for our sin. But it doesn't mean that it's just free for all. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Romans chapter 6. Romans 5 explains clearly, hey, you know what? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter how much you sin, you're still saved because Christ has paid for all of your sins. But does that mean just, okay, well, who cares then, right? No big deal. God forbid. No. And if you say that you know God and you're not keeping his commandments, you're a liar and you don't know him. We know that we know him when we keep his commandments. If we're, if we're you know, doing this and saying, okay, here's a commandment. Okay, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to change my life so I don't do this anymore. Here's something I should be doing. Okay, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do this. That's when you know you know God because you're, you're hearing what he says to you. And it's funny. People want to pray to God all the time. No one's against prayer. Everyone wants to go to God in prayer. But the problem is they expect God to listen to them when they're not listening to him. You want God to listen to you? Do a little bit of listening yourself. And I don't mean audibly. I don't, I'm not saying that God's going to speak in your ear and you're going to hear this little voice. If you're hearing voices, you've got another problem. Come talk to me. We'll try to deal with that. But um, he's spoken to us right here in his word. It's right here. These are God's words. He's the author of this book. He's told us quite a bit. There's a lot of things in here that we should listen to. If we expect God to listen to us, let's listen to him. You know what? He's probably already answered your request right here. Whatever problem you're having that you want to go to God with, you can probably find it here. We need to listen to him. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. We need to be separate. This is taught in the Bible. You sin not. That's in the New Testament. You say, oh, but you went into these, you know, the Old Testament laws and everything else. The law was given in the Old Testament. Sin is the transgression of the law by definition. That's what sin is. You're breaking the law. And in the New Testament, the Apostle John is writing, look, I'm telling you these things so you don't sin, so you don't transgress the law. Jesus Christ did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. Till heaven and earth pass, it's not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's what the Bible says. We ought to love the law of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're also to be sanctified, which also means set apart, separated unto cleanness, because we are washed clean of our sins. Jesus Christ paid the price. He paid the penalty so that you can be washed clean. So that the things that you've done wrong can be wiped away as if they never happened for you. Completely forgiven. Gone. Look at verse number 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Look at this, verse 3. 
Well, I just want to know what the will of God is in my life. What's God's will for me? What should I do, God? What is your will for me in my life? Verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. What's sancti being sanctified? You're set apart. You're separated. He's saying, you need to be separate from this world. You need to separate yourself, your body, from this fornication, from the lasciviousness, from, from the drunkenness, from all the wicked sins of the world. Separate yourself. That's God's will for you. That's what God wants you to do. You need to know how to handle yourself, how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. You need to hold yourself to a higher standard. He's talking about fornication. He doesn't want you being known as the slut, as the whore, as the whoremonger. He says, you're better than that. You're a child of God. Show yourself to be a child of God. You're not just some drunk in the gutter. <clears throat> Verse number five, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That's the way the world is. You're better than that. God's got a higher standard for you. And we ought to live up to that. Verse number six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God's called us unto holiness. We need to be separate. We need to get the sins out of our lives. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 4. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Psalm 4. I'm going to read for you from Luke 6. Luke 6 is the, um, the shorter version of the Beatitudes that's in, uh, in Matthew 5. Luke 6, 22, the Bible reads, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. You know that you're doing well and you're living a separated life when other people are separating themselves from you. That's a good sign. When people stop wanting to be around you, that shows you that you're doing the right thing. When, when, and when I say some people, I mean the world. I don't mean your brothers and sisters at church that are separating themselves from you, right? <laughs> because you're a drunkard or a fornicator. Okay, I'm talking about people of the world. You know, maybe your old friends. And... Anybody who's, who's, who's started to sanctify their life and, and, and get more, more pure and more clean will probably have the same testimony that I have and, and everyone else pretty much has. The more you start to do righteously, the more you, you know, church becomes important to you, the more God becomes important to you, the more reading the Bible becomes important to you, the more soul winning becomes important to you, and all the things that have to do with God, the less and less important things these world have to do with you, you, you that, that you care about. And your friends start to realize that. And, hey, man, you want to go out to the bar and get a drink? No, man, I can't do that. Hey, do you want to go watch a sport? Hey, no, I can't do that. I'm going to church. Hey, do you want to go? You know, they're going to separate themselves from you. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. The Bible says that you're blessed when men hate you. Who would want to hate a Christian? Someone who's actually being a Christian. We have this warped sense that, that Christians should be loved by everybody. That is so unbiblical, it's not even funny. Oh, but that's not very Christian of you. Oh, you think the homo should be put to death? That's not very Christian of you. They put Jesus to death, and I know I'm not better than him. He was hated, he was despised. They conspired to kill him. And I am not better than he. I mean, do you think you're better than Jesus? Are you going through your life without any persecution whatsoever, ever, from anybody? How Christ-like are you? You're blessed when men hate you. You're blessed when they separate you from their company. They don't have anything to do with you because of how you stand. There's people like that in my life. There's people that don't want to have anything to do with me. There's been family members. There's been friends that... You know, even from, from our own wedding. We said, there's not going to be any booze at our wedding. No one's getting drunk. And, you know, we don't want that. People say all kinds of evil things about us because of that. People, you know, don't want us in our company anymore. Oh, yeah, they don't drink. Oh, they don't do that. No, we're not welcome a lot of places anymore. And you know what? That's great. Praise God. I'm fine with it. 
it's funny because all you have to do is hold yourself to certain standards. You don't even have to do the work most of the time of separating them from you. They'll separate you from them. That's right. You're in Psalm chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. Bible reads, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. You sanctify yourself. You separate yourself unto God. God's going to separate you unto him. And he says, the Lord's going to hear when I call unto him. So I was mentioning earlier, you know, you want to be heard of God. Sanctify yourself. Separate yourself. Get a little bit more holy and the holy God will hear you. The holy God will realize, hey, here's someone who actually cares what I say. Here's someone who's making a change in their life. Here's somebody that's listening to me. What do you have for me, son? What can I help you with? And any parent knows this. I've got kids. When, you're, when your children come to you, you want to help them out. But when they come to you with problems because they've gotten themselves into their own messes and stuff, you know, like, well, that's what happens. You know, there's life lessons that kids need to learn. They dig holes for themselves. And it's not like you just want to see them suffer or anything, but there's lessons they need to learn. And you know what? When we get ourselves in our own problems because of our own sin, sometimes God's not going to hear us. And you say, you did this. You brought this on yourself. You're going to reap what you sow. Right. But when he sees you and you are making changes and you are, you are doing your best to try to do what God has for you to do, and maybe you slip and you fall, God's going to be there to help you out, Amen. as any loving father would with their children. Oh, there's a mistake here. You know, they're, they're obedient. They're doing good. They're listening. They're, they're overall really great children. Oh, they made a mistake. I'm right here for you. Amen. God's the same way. There's so many reasons to sanctify ourselves. There's so many reasons that we need to be separate from this world. God has called us to be different. And it's not different for the sake of being different. It's different because the world is wicked and God wants us righteous. It's, it's, you know, if you say, well, I don't understand. How am I supposed to be peculiar? Should I color my hair blue and get a nose ring? You know, no, 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 no. Just follow what this book says. You will be different if you start doing what this book says. You don't have to worry about trying to be different. It'll just happen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction from your words. Lord, help us all to have a good, proper love of your laws, dear Lord. Help us to, to meditate on them and get them in our heart, dear Lord, that we can know the difference between the clean and the unclean, that we can know what a righteous judgment even is, dear God. Help us to know your laws and to know your words and to know the things that will keep us on the right path, dear Lord, that will sanctify us. And, and keep us unspotted from the filth of this world, dear Lord. Help us not to have this self-righteous attitude where we think we're better than everyone else, but where we honestly want to go help others. And Lord, finally, help us not to go soft on sin within the church. It may happen someday. And you know, I know we have a small congregation right, here, right now, God, but we, we have real solid friendships here. People that we honestly care about. Lord, help us to have the strength and the courage when, if, God forbid, someone were to get involved in one of those wicked sins and become a wicked person, that we would have the courage and the strength and, uh, and the sincerity in your, in your word, dear Lord, to do the right thing by separating them from our company and not to eat with them, dear Lord. And, um, and we pray if anyone falls into that condition, that they would be restored so that we could receive them again uh, through their repentance, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.